Uh, first of all, the work of Richard Brandt, uh, who is arguably the first experimental philosopher, at least in the modern tradition. Um, he made his mistakes. He, for example, offered me my first job. Uh, but apart from that, uh, a quite admirable figure in this area. Uh, and here's the way Brandt got started in this. So as I, I suppose most of you know, uh, in the anthropological literature, going all the way back to Westermark in the early years of the 20th century, perhaps even earlier than that, there's plenty of evidence documenting divergent moral outlooks in different cultures. But traditional ethnography gives us little guidance on what would happen to that moral disagreement under idealized circumstances, particularly, of course, when one of the non-idealizing circumstances sitting off in the background are the religious and or metaphysical views of the people being studied in the ethnography. Well, in the early 1950s, uh, Brandt began a study of the Hopi Indians in the American Southwest with the very explicit goal uh, of, and Brandt, by the way, is a moral philosopher, for those of you who don't know, uh, so he went out and taught himself or tried to teach himself the methods of ethnography. Uh, and his goal was to provide the kind of ethnography that would, in fact, address the concerns uh, of moral philosophers. Well, what Brandt found, uh, reported in his book, published, I think, in the early 60s, maybe the late 50s, uh, his book called Hopi Ethics, uh, is that there are, in fact, a number of uh, very notable moral differences between the Hopis of that period and white Americans of that period that Brandt couldn't trace to non-moral sources. Uh, the example that everybody talks about, the most famous of these, uh, is that the Hopi children uh, used to adopt small animals, typically birds, but sometimes other small animals, as pets. And they played very roughly with these pets. Uh, the pets typically ended up with broken bones after a day or two, and rarely survived more than three or four days. There was nothing confidential or secret about that. It was done right in the middle of the village. Everybody knew what was happening. Uh, and uh, Brandt uh, was sort of, uh, you know, with his uh, <clears throat> middle-class white American sensibilities, quite shocked by the appalling treatment uh, accorded to these small animals. Uh, well, he looked for, uh, he, by the way, he asked the uh, Hopi elders, uh, you know, do you know this is going Of course we know it's going on, right? It's right there in front of us. Uh, well, is this okay? And they looked at, of course it's okay. What's the problem? Well, so Brandt, uh, first of all, said, Yes, there's a moral disagreement. Is it a superficial disagreement? Could it, in fact, depend on some non-moral disagreement? And he worked remarkably hard at trying to find a non-moral disagreement, uh, but couldn't succeed. So, for example, here's the first idea here that, uh, naturally, what would a philosopher think of? Maybe the Hopi are intuitive Cartesians, uh, right? They think humans are conscious, but animals are automata. And uh, so, you know, it doesn't matter if you break the parts off an automaton, particularly if it's a cheap automaton found out in the forest, okay, well, in the desert. Uh, but no, uh, he asked the Hopi about this, uh, and they thought he was mad, quite yeah, Of course the animals feel pain. Uh, indeed, they probably feel pain more sensitively than humans, the Hopi thought. Well, he tried lots of ideas. He even went so far as to think, well, maybe they think it's okay to torture the birds because these animals uh, <clears throat> who suffer martyrdom are rewarded for their martyrdom uh, like St. Sebastian uh, in the afterlife. And he asked the Hopi about that, and the Hopi looked at him as though he were insane uh, and explained to him, no, uh, that's not uh, the case. Uh, and he tried a, a, a large array of other possibilities uh, and could find uh, nothing uh, that would suggest that the disagreement at the moral level was rooted in a disagreement and uh, on a non-moral question. Uh, so Brandt tentatively, uh, he grants that uh, this is hardly conclusive, but he tentatively concludes that these moral disagreements are fundamental, uh, that they reflect what he called a basic difference in attitude that wouldn't in fact disappear under his own favored version uh, of the ideal observer theory, which he called the qualified attitude theory. He went on to argue that 
his own version of the qualified attitude theory or of the ideal observer theory, uh, because of these empirical facts, did in fact lead to relativism. And he argued that other versions of the ideal observer theory leads to lead to skepticism. 